Well, hey, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome. Am I getting a, a little bit of feedback here? Maybe if I, I stand over here, I'm better? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, so hey, welcome to um, you know complex event processing made easy with uh, Apache Cassandra and uh, Quine Streaming Graph. Um, my name is Aaron Pletz. I'm a developer advocate with Datastax. Um, I'm fairly active in the Cassandra community. Um, if, you, if you have problems and you've asked questions on Stack Overflow, there's, I, I figured it out one day, it's, there's like a 16% chance that I've helped you if, um, since I've, I've answered so much of uh, and the, uh, the questions in the Cassandra tag. But um, so yeah. Um, and then of course with me, I have uh, Ethan, Ethan from, uh, from that dot. So Ethan, I've, take it away. Uh, yeah, I'm Ethan. I've been at that dot since its inception, just about, uh, and know the internals of Quine from every, every layer and just love discussing it. So that's what we'll be doing a little bit of today, as well as uh, playing with the general ideas of, of stream processing. Um, so with that, I'm going to just jump into it. So stream processing, um, I want to give a quick layout of what we're going to go over. We're going to cover the general topic of stream processing, uh, kind of where complex comes into it, where we start thinking about complex event processing, uh, the challenges you're likely to face if you're dealing with any kind of stream processing, uh, how the product that my company makes, Quine, uh, how that addresses a lot of those challenges, uh, how Cassandra really enables Quine to address those challenges, and uh, we're going to run through a case study for you of a password spraying attack and how you might detect that using kind of a streaming paradigm. And then we'll conclude with a few resources, places you can go if you're curious, if you're wanting to learn more, or just you know chat with us. We're fun, I promise. Yeah, yeah. We're we're not we're not totally lame. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what is stream processing? Um, stream processing is a kind of of uh, data oriented development where you're typically trying to draw real-time conclusions from current information. I have a little asterisk on current, uh, because current can mean a few things. It can mean real-time. It can mean um, this happened two minutes ago, and I want to react to it. This can, mean, it can mean this happened 14 milliseconds ago, and I want to react to it. Or it can just mean current with respect to I'm reading a big pool of data, and I want to be focused on the, the head of that pool, the, the latest thing I've read. Um, and they're typically, uh, stream, uh, stream processing tasks are typically kind of event-based. So you're thinking about things like uh, social media updates, things like server logs, uh, anything that is more about sort of small changes over time rather than big snapshots being relayed in kind of a loop. Uh, and uh, related to that, uh, one of the sort of limitations on what stream processing is, in my opinion, is that you uh, you tend to think of less batching. You tend to think of less uh, large, uh, large blobs of data coming through. And uh, as a result of that, uh, there are some uh, limitations and some strengths to stream processing. And a couple of, of those are um, the loose consistency bounds. So you don't have the ability to say, hey, this answer that I've computed is correct over all of the data, because I'm not dealing with all the data. I'm dealing with the latest data, or I'm dealing with some subset of the data. And uh, error correction as well, it kind of falls in that vein of, I'm not necessarily going to be totally uh, consistent in my answers with respect to the entire data set. Uh, I will be able to give you some kind of bounded answer. I'll be able to say, you know, based on this information, here's a definitively correct answer. Uh, so the thing with that, though, is that you often don't need these full guarantees, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so difference between stream processing and complex event processing. Typical stream processing, your data comes in, you do some operation, another operation, another operation, you're doing some filtering, you're doing some mapping, folding, whatever you want to do. Um, complex event processing is where you start to introduce persistent state. And this comes in in typically one of three ways. Uh, either you're dealing with more than one event at a time or more than a static number of events at a time, and you're thinking about things here like sliding windows, saying, I want to be computing some answers in real time based on the last 20 events or the last 400,000 events or the last two days of events. You can get time-based in here. Um, the, uh, another common way that you'll get into this complex or stateful space is uh, when you're joining multiple streams, and this is because uh, you have to worry about what happens if those uh, those sources of information that uh, talk about the same sort of entity, they talk about the same user, uh, but they're coming from different sources and therefore coming at different times. How do I join that information together without losing anything? 
uh, and while still retaining sort of bounded resource use, bounded resource use, usage. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and then going one step further than that, uh, you have the problem of joining a stream with itself, which is all those problems of joining streams and sources, as well as all those problems of dealing with more than one event at a time, where you've got something like, um, I want to take action, I want, I want to change the action I'm taking on incoming data based on something I've already computed about that data. So now I've got this problem of, well, feeding back in that decision is equivalent to joining multiple streams, uh, as well as I'm reasoning about multiple things at once. Like, I've, I've got to deal with this part of the stream and this part of the stream and the connection between them. Um, that can be really difficult. Uh, but it also enables far more powerful computation. You get back some of those, uh, those trade-offs that you get in stream processing in the first place of consistency. You can start to say, hey, I am going to inform my decisions. Uh, I'm going to make maybe a heuristic initial decision and then look back at my existing data to ensure that um, my answer, my computed answer, is correct for everything that's come in since then or everything in the past. Um, that's, again, a, an example of kind of a stream joining back on itself. Um, one concrete example on this, you might, uh, you might use a alert uh, to update your alerting rule. You might say, hey, this account looks suspicious. Uh, let me set a new flag in real time to watch everything related to that account or everything related to everything related to that account. You can do some kind of tag propagation, if you will. Um, so stream processing can be hard. Um, you have to, especially when you're dealing with this complex event processing, you have to choose some things. You have to choose your window size, your time interval. You have to handle things that are bigger than in memory and therefore kind of how you downsample. That's the case for all of these constraints. Uh, when you have more data than you can deal with right now, how do you deal with it? Um, that's not always an easy answer. It's not as simple as, oh, I'm going to keep the latest 700 events. Because what happens if something really important was the 701st previous event and you lose it? You don't want to lose results like that if you can avoid it. At some point, you have to make some trade-off decisions, but you can push that out a little bit further with some of the technology we're going to show today. Uh, and then uh, other challenges, latency is a big one. Uh, again, with kind of the nature of streaming being usually you're dealing with some notion of real time and some notion of current where, again, current can mean current based on a pool of existing data, or it can mean current based on some live, like, coming from the world data. Um, that consistency aspect, as well as a uh, specific problem in consistency, is result in validation. I computed an answer based on uh, positions 5,000 through 6,000 in the stream, but something comes in at position 6,502 and says, actually, I was a little too eager with my data at position 5,000. Uh, please correct this. Please go back somehow. Even though you've already computed this answer in a streaming fashion, please alert me that that decision might have changed now. Um, and then the general problem of, of kind of distributed systems of if you have any kind of multiple data sources, then you want to make sure that your reasoning is consistent with respect to some notion of time over those data sources. So this is the part where I say, we've got an answer. Stream processing <laughs> was hard, but now we've got Quine. Uh, Quine is the product I spend 99% of my time working on at that dot. Um, the idea is that we take a lot of data uh, and uh, allow the user to declaratively configure how they want to intake that data, how they want to work with that data, and how they want to act on that data, including actions taken to affect the actions that they're taking, which is a little abstract. I'll get <laughs> back to it. Um, put another way, there's kind of three steps here. Um, you're gonna, uh, we're, we have a property graph data model, which means we represent data as a mathematical graph where everything is either edges or nodes, nodes or vertexes, vertices, same thing. Uh, a node has properties, like key value map of properties, and labels. Edges can have labels. Uh, then the usage experience looks like, hey, I've got my data. It's not necessarily something I would think of as a graph. Uh, how do I want to structure as a graph? Uh, what structure do I want to know about in my data, and how can I encode that as a graph? Uh, 
as well as how do I want to handle that structure being found? Um, I would just add too that um, you know, Quine as a you know as a graph tool isn't a lot different from any of the other you know graph databases or graph tools that you might already be used to. Um, you know, I know that things like like Janus Graph and uh, Neo4j they're all property property you know based uh, graph models. Um, and likewise, too, I think, I think they both allow, oh, Janus Graph, maybe not, but I think they both allow you to use Cypher, which is kind of becoming a standard in the, uh, in the graph world as well, um, which Quine does, and, and we'll show you a little bit in Cypher coming up as well. Yes. Um, so let's, let's step back a second, and I've been talking a lot about data and computation in the very abstract sense. Let's look at a specific example, so a real-world problem. Uh, password spraying. I've got some malicious actor that has made a list of usernames somewhere and got a list of passwords somewhere, and they want to find where those usernames and passwords overlap. Very classic, easy problem, um, you would think. What happens, though? So, so a typical solution to this problem is look for someone to fail their password entry three times and then require them to reset the password. Kind of a bad user experience. Uh, usually, uh, as a streaming, if you look at this through that streaming lens, uh, has a question there of rate of three times within what window? If it's indefinite, how do I remember that it was indefinite? Uh, if it's in a bound, then what happens if someone goes just slower than that bound? What happens if someone is, is spraying passwords? Or, uh, in this case, what happens if someone is trying the same password across a bunch of different users? Uh, that's another option, and that's one that traditional heuristics for detecting these logins often miss on, uh, that Quine handles no problem. So this is the kind of structure that we're going to be thinking about. Again, going back to step one, uh, look for or define the structure that you're looking for. So we are looking for a repeated sequence of accesses over any time frame where Someone tries to log in and fails. Someone tries to log in, fails, 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 success. Right? Sequence of failures from the same user agent, from the same client, mm -hmm. for the same account that ultimately ends up succeeding. Um, but only after a certain number of failures, a, a suspicious number of failures. That could be over, again, any time frame, maybe months. Um, we can encode this pattern using that Cypher graph language. This is, again, kind of the current industry standard for interacting with uh, graph-shaped data. Uh, I'm not going to get too in the weeds on it, but the, the orange node is our, our uh, victim, our potential victim. The blue node is our potential attacker, um, corresponding to the top and bottom of this structure. Uh, and I'm going to say, again, where I have a sequence of uh, nodes that represent Login attempts that were all uh, were all failures followed by a success. If I find that pattern, I'm going to return a location that that pattern exists, so I can do some further processing on it. So then, step two: How do I respond to that? How do I respond to a detection of that pattern? In this case, I'm going to uh, basically put it back in the graph. I'm going to add it to my event stream, and this is a case of feeding back in to the source event stream. Um, and I'm going to say, hey, uh, I found this pattern, therefore I'm going to flag the victim and say, here's the time they were likely uh, compromised at. I'm going to flag the uh, attacker and say, hey, this user agent is a likely bad actor. Uh, and then I can uh, chain that into further patterns. Uh, again, feeding back into the, the source stream lets me define any number of patterns I like and act on them independently. So I can act on the pattern of a malicious, uh, uh, a malicious user agent. I can act on the pattern of someone who has logged in after they were likely compromised. I can do any of that, uh, all from the same stream, all in this kind of declarative way. Uh, and that just leaves, how do I actually get the data into the system in the first place? How do I make this graph? Because I'm looking at something that's a, a, a log of uh, attempted logins. I'm not looking at Cypher queries coming in from my Apache log. I'm looking at you know log files, right? Um, let's say they're JSON because it simplifies things a little bit and it's not too hard to imagine encoding or decoding from that, uh, where each login record just has a user ID, success, 
uh, timestamp and the login IP to, re to represent the user agent. Uh, that's all I need to write a query like this, where I say, all right, identify that user based on the ID in the log, identify that user agent based on the IP in the log, uh, set the data I acquired, make a note of it in kind of a, a persistent way, um, and then using those pieces of information, just link them together at the end. Uh, just create some, some graph structure. And it's as simple as that to do the ingest. Uh, and at this point, if you're uh, at all engineering oriented, you might be thinking like, okay, but you just told me like all of these shortcomings of complex event processing and how these things are really hard. So why didn't you mention Windows? Why didn't you mention uh, time bounds? Uh, why didn't you mention this problem of out of order events? And the answer is, I didn't, I kind of did. I said Quine. And that's the entire premise of Quine. That is what I do spending 99% of my time on, is making it so that Quine handles that so you don't have to. Um, and the way it manages that is through an intelligent in-memory cache. So it keeps uh, the important nodes, the nodes that you're interacting with frequently, it keeps those rapidly available, and any others, it persists via Cassandra in a very scalable way. Uh, and in a way that allows new events to still influence arbitrarily old events. Um, and between these two technologies, they both scale kind of uh, unbounded uh, horizontally and linearly uh, to create a really robust, uh, really robust system. And to get a little bit more into how that works, I'm going to hand off to Aaron now uh, to talk about Cassandra a bit. All right, and, and of course, Cassandra, I mean, really, that's, that's uh, you know, one of the reasons why we're, why we're all here. Um, I just just a quick poll of the room. Who, how many in here consider yourselves, um, you know, maybe maybe new to Cassandra? I got, yeah, all right. I got a few. All right. Don't worry, Carter. You're not alone. Oh, I just I just called you out there. I'm, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and 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 everyone else has used Cassandra a bit. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, but of course, the Cassandra that we all know and love, um, you know, as uh, as Ethan mentioned, scales linearly and horizontally. Um, it. Uh, distributes replicas geographically, which, to be honest, is probably my, my favorite feature of, of Cassandra. Um, to, you know, in, in all the years that I've been using it, uh, which is like 11 now, <laughs> um, I haven't found another database that does this as well as Cassandra does. I mean, maybe you could make an argument for like Google Spanner, but when you actually, when you also own the network that you're running your database on, there are some liberties that you can take to you know, make, things, make things run a little, run a little faster. So, so I don't know if I count that. Um, and then, of course, maintains high availability. Um, you know, that's that's um, really where I where I think Cassandra gets like like a lot of its um, you know great engineering around performance and uh, you know and, and you know keeping things up to date and uh, you know allowing things to run really really well. Um, when you're using Quine with Cassandra, um, this is this is kind of sorta how it looks. Where um, you know you have your you have your um, data coming in through like uh, you know being ingested. It's uh, streaming into the graph. Um, graph Engine actually interacts with Cassandra directly. Um, there are aspects of, um, of Quine that I don't know if we've touched on too much in terms of um, you know, having things like, uh, like a standing query. And, um, and what was the other one up here? Oh, yeah, just standing query. Sure, yeah, sure. standing query the is and, a yeah. piece of terminology uh, yeah. to refer to that, define that structure that you want, and just uh, define the action you're going to take in response to that structure. That's all a standing query is, is the combination of those two concepts. Uh, so when you see that in that graphic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, come on, clicker. OK, there we go. So um, of course, too, you know, we have um, you know, just, a, just a general overview of, of Cassandra. You know, works in the um, you know, peer to peer architecture. Every, every node can handle every single request. Um, that's really what allows Cassandra to scale so well. Um, and, and of course, you know, it's, it's kind of contained like this in each individual, like, um, like um, you know, I, I'd say, say like region or, or data center. Um, and then they can be, they can be communica communicating together, um, you know, by the, uh, by the gossip protocol. And actually with Cassandra 5.1, the uh, gossip protocol will be replaced with, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. I can picture the, the Cassandra enhancement process number. Hey, transactional metadata. There you go. Thank you, Raul. <laughs> I'm like, I know it's CEP21, but it, yeah, okay. 
All right. And of course, you know, also important to mention that you can run um, Quine on top of AstroDB as well. Um, so, you know, if you if you decide you don't want to ma have to manage Cassandra or key people on staff who uh, who know how to do that, you can you can also run it that way. Um, and I, and I think Quine also runs on is it is it MapDB and uh, RocksDB? Rocks we have RocksDB as a as a local option. RocksDB, uh, yeah. Although, yeah, getting into production, you definitely want to benefit from that that horizontal scalability. And uh, of, of the Cassandra, careful consideration right. of Cassandra right. versus, or Astra. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, when I was um, when I was working at Target, I got into an argument with somebody once about um, is RocksDB actually a database? Because I don't think it is. You know, and when I think of databases, I think of like a completed Lego set, and RocksDB is a box of Legos. It, you know, it's it's take it and and build it and put it together and and manage your file system access. I mean, to me, that's not what a database. I mean, it does do that, but it that yeah. Anyway. I digress. Um, so hey, we have a uh, demo where we can show you this, um, you know, this password spraying attack. Um, I apologize for the slide. Uh, I copied this one from another presentation, and I was on a big Cyberpunk 2077 kick when I, I built this one. So that's that's why the yeah. Anyway, um, so essentially, we're going to start uh, Quine and Cassandra locally, and you'll be able to watch that. And then um, we're going to run this uh, password spraying ingest. Which will, which will simulate all of these different user interactions, user logons, user authentications. And the idea is, is that we're going to throw like an alert when we see one that kind of deviates from that standard pattern of access that we're, that we're used to seeing. So let me just uh, plow through that. While Aaron's working on this, I can emphasize uh, the reason this all works from uh, that perspective of, hey, there's these hard problems in stream processing, uh, is careful usage of the strengths of Quine and Cassandra together. In both cases, we're dealing with uh, very clever uh, work distribution models. We're dealing with uh, a very uh, sort of holistic approach to data management, I would say, um, where events are first class. Uh, this is something you don't see in a lot of traditional systems, uh, but that ability of Quine and Cassandra to treat your, your operational events, your individual pieces that end up building that big picture as first class citizens rather than having to wait for that big picture to be built up, that's the, that's the secret sauce that makes all of this function uh, so effectively. Hey, look at that, we got a hit. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we have our standing queries here, you know, that, uh, that kind of keep track of, one keeps track of like, you know, normal activity. And then our second standing query looks for anything that deviates from that. And as you can see, we have a count of one on that, that second standing query there. Um, so what I'm gonna do is Hold try on. and, yeah, try and decipher where the URL starts here. <laughs> And I think I think it's just that. Decipher. Oh yeah, decipher. Oh, you know what? I bet I don't want that trailing quote, so I'll, I'll backspace that. Okay. All right. So if I paste that in, get rid of that double quote, this should bring up the Quine graph with the um, with the problematic uh, anomaly that uh, that we detected. Oh, look at that. All right. Excuse the uh, the physics engine here for a second. But um, if I take some of these and kind of line them up a little bit better here, there we go. All right. So as you can see, we have, um, it looks like one, two, three, four bad attempts at uh, logging in for this particular user. And then on the fifth one, they finally made it in. Now, kind of like, like what Ethan was, was saying in that, um, this this type of uh, this type of um, like an architecture layer allows you to pick up problems in flight as they're happening, um, because otherwise you'd be you'd be running a report like this, you know, two weeks later and go, oh, I think um, I think we had a uh, you know a malicious a malicious attack here and we didn't realize it until now. Whereas this will allow you to pick that up right away. Um, so yeah, that and and by the way, yeah, I'm. I'm super glad that uh, Ethan had the suggestion to run this all locally on my laptop. Um, I was originally not trying to do that, and we were at the mercy of the, the conference Wi-Fi. So that, that whole talk about latency, that was, that was very real earlier. <laughs> all right, I can break out of that. Um, you know, I just wanted to mention, too, that this, 
this collaboration between um, you know DataStax and Quine kind of kind of um, originated as a workshop that we ran together. You know, I don't know how many of you follow our DataStax developers YouTube channel, but about a year-ish and a half ago, um, we actually put together this workshop, and the Git repo is still out there. I have the um, the link at the end, but um, it's got step by step how you can go through and um, and actually recreate this process and, and kind of talk you through like what's happening and um, you know how to make it work, how to configure it, um, yeah, how to get uh, either Cassandra or AstroDB running on the back end, and uh, yeah. Oh, oh, it works with Quine 1.3.2. That might be a little old. <laughs> <laughs> Substitute some version numbers appropriately. <laughs> so real quick, I want to touch back on, back to the generalized. Uh, where might you apply this? Where might uh, this Quine, Cassandra, Astra combination be really helpful for you? Uh, as part of your production data pipeline, if you ever deal with real-time data, or large bodies of, of uh, event-oriented data. Uh, anytime you're combining data from multiple sources, anything that's self-referential, that's somewhere you should have something in the back of your mind going, ah, oh, remember that Quine thing? <laughs> this might be applicable. But also, just as a lightweight utility, um, we have this thing called recipes. That's actually how this demo is implemented. You just give it a file that is a, a bundle of, here's how, I, how, here's how I want to do those three steps, structure, creation, monitoring. Um, and run it through. I love using this in uh, pre-processing pipelines for AI work for any kind of, of data engineering, uh, where I just want to do some uh, data manipulation that's a little more complicated than when I can encode in something like JQ or XSV or you know standard SQL. Uh, it's also got that UI, which is good for data set exploration if you want to just click around your data and kind of see how that manifests in a very sort of uh, real way. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we've got some resources, and I think we've got time for mm, two questions. Yeah. How's the uh, How's the font showing? Oh, that's not terrible. Okay. Okay. Ooh, that's where I get feedback. These uh, These slides are also available on the uh, the the Sketch app um, that the conference is being run through. Any questions? Uh, yes, I know you've had your hand up for a while. <laughs> uh, I noticed, uh, maybe it was just a demo. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the question was, uh, I, we saw uh, some ACA-related logs. Is that what Quine's built on? And absolutely. Uh, Quine is built on an actor-oriented... Oh, it's not? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Quine is built on an actor-oriented model, um, uh, ACA, PECO kind of equivalent, um, where each, in fact, each node corresponds exactly to one actor. It's kind of an enhanced actor. It's a smart actor that knows how to... Uh, shut itself down and persist itself to disk, and then how to rehydrate itself from disk where necessary, where disk, again, means Cassandra, uh, or a Cassandra equivalent uh, data store. Um, but yes, ACA is absolutely some of, the, some of the magic here. Yes? Yes, this one. Right. This one. Yes. You got so how, how do you actually construct a graph? So let's say you have logs, mm -hmm. and then you have uh, different columns, mm -hmm. and then you have the same client and same actor, mm -hmm. and then you have different attempts to access mm -hmm. the password. So if you have something like a, uh, a regular IP network, you have mm -hmm. routers, and I'm getting events from each uh, or some of the routers. So in that case, the, the, the structural relationship between the routers is already inferred from the network. Mm -hmm. Here you're dynamically inferring it from, from the log files based on the columns. Mm -hmm. Is there any way I could adapt this for event uh, correlation in the network where you already know the structural issue between the, the nodes? Yeah, ab and absolutely. Um, it's helpful to think of that initial topology as a, a static, uh, static stream of events, kind of a, an initial stream. Uh, you can combine any number of, of data sources into Quine. Uh, so starting with something like a topology, uh, you can ingest each of those routers as a node or as whatever representation you want. I would probably start with one node per router, make the edges each, uh, make the edges correspond. And the trick there comes in with how you resolve those nodes. So we would recommend 
uh, using a form of deterministic uh, deterministic hashing to uh, compute the node ID sort of in advance based on some unique identifier that's going to be consistent across your different data sources. So something like the uh, the MAC address or the the router ID. The router ID exactly. Um, and you can do any kind of combination of this. If you don't have that available in all contexts, then what you might want to do instead of representing each router as a single node is represent it as a little cluster of related nodes and just kind of build that cluster uh, as you can as your data streams in and include in your, in your pattern that you're looking for, include that larger shape. And, and uh, yeah, use any data from anywhere in that shape you want in your response. Wow. Okay, nice. All right, and then... One more? There we go. Yeah, it's just probably a practical question out of sure. all the projects you use that uh, the coin mm -hmm. for. Um, let's say you have an uh, event which has 400 properties and your mm -hmm. event's coming at 3,000 per second. Mm -hmm. Is that something that it can handle? Absolutely. Uh, so For Cassandra backend, I, I'm sure. But <laughs> yes, ab absolutely. Um, Cassandra does give us a lot of that power. Quine on top of Cassandra is a relatively lightweight layer, and it scales very, very well. It scales in a way very similar to Cassandra in terms of using that peer-to-peer -peer, uh, model between the different hosts. Um, we have scaled Quine up to processing uh, just short of 100 million events per second uh, on a ridiculously large cluster, naturally. Um, but on a uh, on a single host, on a single like the MacBook, right? Uh, you can pretty easily get around 9,000, 10,000 events per second. Uh, and the reason I'm referring to events here is um, because there is some component that is taking the the event, decoding it, JSON deserializing, uh, creating the query to interact with the graph, that sort of thing. And then there's also the component of well, each node is doing some computation as well. Um, so back of the envelope, about 9,000 uh, events per second per host is a, is a reasonable, uh, reasonable estimate for what the capacity of a coin uh, cluster is going to look like. Uh, how big are those events is a great question. Uh, it doesn't matter much uh, is kind of the, the thing. If it's 500 properties, it's 500 properties. Um, you start to run into a couple issues if you have a single property that's particularly large, uh, and that's just due to uh, choices in data modeling. Uh, that can usually be worked around without any kind of trouble, um, especially if you want to just uh, kind of normalize your, your large payloads into an external store in kind of the, I guess, kind of the canonical way. Um, does that answer your question? Awesome. All right. Uh, yes, the, the bulk of the latency in, in every case we've seen is deserialization and serialization. So the, uh, the time it takes to write and read from the network or from a file, mm -hmm. um, exactly, yeah. Uh, and in practice, a, a structure like the one that we looked at here, we have, here it is, a structure like this. Uh, Matching all parts of this has a round trip latency of about 13 milliseconds, something at that level. Even if you're using SSD? Even if you're using SSD. Yeah, but this is across a network. Anybody else? All right. I, I think that's all we got, huh? I think so. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.